this, the Get Published Radio Show. And here's your host, Gerald Everett Jones, the guy who has the answers because, well, he's made all the mistakes himself. On today's show, our topic is poetry and spoken word. Our guest today will be creative coach Terry Silverman. Isn't poetry spoken word? I guess it is when you read it aloud, duh. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure I know the answer, but before we hear from Terry, let's talk about the difference between poetry and spoken word. Tom, what do you think the difference is? I don't know. What is the difference between poetry and spoken word? Isn't poetry spoken word? My guess is that spoken word is a kind of a poetry. It's a sort of a more narrative type of poetry in which you are directly engaging or pretending that you're directly engaging with people in front of you. Poetry, you can sit in the silence of your smelly little room all alone and read it and get really very excited about it. Would you guys say that maybe poetry is more kind of free form and spoken word is more narrative? Well, it, it would agree. seem so. It would seem so, but I'm not sure that that's a distinction that's hard and fast. No. Yeah, I'd, see the, I'd think that we're, I'd think the opposite is true. Uh, narrative is more spoken word in my opinion, because narrative, for example, in poetry, you're telling a story quite often when you are speaking. You, uh, yes, and poetry, poetry may be an impression yeah, and not a story. It may true. be a mood. Maybe just 90% of it is in your head and you're sharing out of your head rather than engaging with other people. Yeah. You know, we could say, well, all right, poetry doesn't make sense and, yeah, and spoken I mean, word does. I Believe think, it or not, you can say that I, I, and you'd be amazed. I, yeah. I think so because poetry tends to be much, at least the way I've seen it, much more abstract, whereas spoken word is really saying this is what happened and yeah. kind of guiding you We are through. here in this world. Yeah. And at Poetry, I am in my world. Right, exactly. Well, the thing that has struck me is, I mean, I, naturally in our podcast marketing and our audience analysis, you know, we're looking at uh, the kinds of things that are popular. And number one, I was struck by the fact that NPR actually puts out more material and gets more hits than any of the commercial podcast distributors, okay? Mm -hmm. WHYY and um, CBS, for example. And of those, the most popular format, uh, and I think even the singularly most popular show is The Moth, which is all spoken word. And those seem to be people standing up in front. They're recorded in live venues, typically. People standing up in front of audiences and engaging them. And they do seem to be stories. I mean, I can't say mm -hmm. I've listened to mm -hmm. every episode, but the ones that I've heard is, you know, they may be dating anecdotes. They may be, a lot of them are relationship issues. My, you know, That's all over the radio. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So is that? Do you listen to that kind of stuff, Cheyenne? Uh, yeah, I love that kind of stuff. So interesting, just to have someone. Whether it's you know, it, like I think a lot of uh, Tom's vignettes that he does are kind of in a way spoken word kind of narrating mm. through these historical events or concepts and it's very calming in a way to just listen to someone speak on a topic they're knowledgeable about and kind of take you through a little story but in a verbal form versus you know reading it on a page well i would characterize tom's vignettes which actually are far more popular than my book reviews <laughs> by, but i'm not going to go jealous on that but what I think I would describe your vignettes as audio essays. And I okay. think that you usually, well, I think always, you've got some point of view there. And you really, you really do, in fine narrative style, and, and I might say, and proudly old-fashioned narrative style, is you button them. At the end, you've got a point, and you, you bring it home. You know, and you're usually a callback to the title. Okay, yeah. so you've got two minutes of narration. But the thing is, don't you think spoken word is so often so much more open-ended. It's almost like the narrator isn't really quite sure where she's going. Well, I think it's probably quite true. One interesting thing to think about is to say it's uh, getting to be popular. It's been some time before it's been popular. And to his present audience, it's brand new. It's not brand new to us because we're all at least 107 years old. But to And you heard Homer tell, tell the stories originally. Yeah, right? yeah we, were there when, we were there when the... <laughs> Second World War <laughs> happened or whatever, but it's sort of new. I was talking something... about the Peloponnesian, but that's okay. Oh, okay, well, anyway, popular culture, it just rolls over every generation. 
Uh, they out well, with this, out with that. Uh, this is coming back. When radio was the only way of listening, you had a lot of spoken word. It was average stuff that you would hear, a lot of it. But uh, Man in the street kind of thing? Yeah, things? TV came, and then formal newscasts came, and now we've been blitzed by the Internet, which is an avalanche of kind of useless information. If I'm, <laughs> Well, we have also, talked about it as an engine of gossip, and I think yeah. you know that probably describes Facebook better than just about anything, is the mm-hmm. idea of neighbors sharing gossip. Yeah, but mm-hmm. spoken word and poetry delivered by a person standing there, that's something new. Let's go see that, for example. So you there's, think we've kind of made a circle back. Well, there's a force yeah. of personality, and I think, you know, we have this cult of stardom, and, you know, everybody, it's the old Andy Warhol, you know, everybody's going to be famous for 15 minutes, but there is that desire, I think. Some of our guests have also alluded to the idea that people want to be heard or they want to be yeah. listened to. I would say that I think that's a huge part of poetry and spoken word making a comeback in this generation is that we want to express our in a way that's not as structured. And I think th- something like writing, you know, a memoir, say, or a mm-hmm. book is much more rigid and, you know, you, then you have to go get it published and this and that versus going to a cafe and standing up and, you know, speaking a piece. Yeah, open-ended, yeah. It's very, it can be very, like, therapeutic for someone uh, because it is kind of a free space to just kind of put it, put yourself out there. Um, well, I've, so I've it's heard a stand-up very, comics crack, it, you know, yeah. at, at two in the morning, you know, some Somebody gets up and you know start and tells what they would call observational humor, mm-hmm. okay? Yeah. And nobody laughed. The comic turns to me, and goes, "Ah, spoken word." <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, it's you know, it's a way of com- the comics have a kind of dissing each other, but uh, but in some ways, if it's the comics often have what they call a workout room, and the audience is other comics. There's no other audience. And they're trying stuff out. And that can sometimes just come across as rants and ramble. And you just, but you also can be some big discoveries that you don't realize come out when you speak to other people. Thoughts come into your head that don't happen when you're writing, when you're sitting there with that machine and the keyboard suddenly and you have this thing. Wise there. words, but Father Suddenly Page. you're talking to people and wham. They feed you back, or suddenly you just get an idea from because somebody is listening. That's uh, invaluable when that happens. Get Published Radio will be right back after this message. You know, Get Published is all about helping you. Yeah, I mean you get published. And these days, the way to go is self-publishing, where there are no agents or editors or big publishing houses telling you you can't or making you feel like you're not good enough. You know, going back in history, many famous authors were self-publishers. With his own printing press, Benjamin Franklin published Poor Richard's Almanac in 1732, long before he was a famous statesman. That's how we know Ben's sayings, such as, fish and visitors smell in three days. Seriously, if you want to change your life or change the world or both, it's a great time to get in the game. Ebooks are particularly easy. With a click, you can reach a worldwide audience. Did you know that there are more people in China who read English than those of us who use the language in all the rest of the world? So if you've got a story to tell, write that memoir or that novel that's been percolating in your head. And if you're an established professional, or if you have a job you dislike or no job at all, give us that business or technical or even political book that establishes you as an expert who deserves serious attention. Yes, it's easy to get published, but understand you'll need help if you want professional results. Editors and copy editors help you clean up your prose. Book designers make the product eye-catching. And publicists help you be heard above all that social media noise. We have those support resources on our website, getpublishedradio.com. And there we've also got a request for services form, where you can get personal attention for whatever might be keeping you from getting it done. That's why we say GetPublishedRadio.com is your doorway to unlimited self-expression. Hey, it's all about the First Amendment. Use it or lose it. Welcome back as Gerald Cheyenne and Tom welcome author, performance artist, and writing coach Terry Silverman. Welcome to Get Published Radio, Terry. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Gerald. Hi, Terry. How do you help develop people's stories and investigate their stories, whether it's for the page or for the stage? Well, the first thing is that I love to have people know that they have a voice and that their stories matter. So I take people with wherever they are in their writing process. 
I, in my classes, I always have in-class writing exercises, and that's to help bark ideas as well as to release the critic, because that's always half the battle. And one thing that I've developed is to help people discover and investigate is doing something that I call a guided improv. So somebody will start telling a story, and I will start asking questions to help them really dig and go into the moment. And I've noticed that something happens in our brain when we're being listened to that can't happen on the page. So I use that as a tool to help people, whether or not they are or aren't performing, to really get the story down that needs and wants to be told. Well, wow, release the critic. That sounds, <laughs> well, that sounds like a term of art. I want to know more about that, but it also sounds a little bit scary. Well, I mean, we naturally always want to be good and we want to have praise. And in that, it's going to actually stop the creative impulse. So our, sub- our creative gold is in our left brain, which is the subconscious. So that's why I give spontaneous writing exercises and also do oral storytelling where I start asking questions because you don't have time then to censor or hope that it's good. You just have to, you know, it's a way to tap into going to whatever your creative impulse is or creative intuition. Very powerful. And it takes practice. So it's not going to go away right away, but you have a short amount of time, you have structure, and you are focusing on something so you don't have time to worry about if it's good or if it's bad. And literally, that's how I was trained because when I first started writing, whenever I had to write in school, I would get paralyzed and I would want to eat so many donuts that I thought I would die. (laughs) And I had a brilliant playwriting teacher that would do these spontaneous writing exercises every week and that's how I learned to get out of my own way and out of my head and not worry about if it was good or bad on the paper. Because after it's on the paper, then you have plenty of time afterwards, after you've fully investigated the first draft, to revise and edit. But you can't edit and create simultaneously, otherwise you're out of the impulse and you're on the other side, you're then in the analytical brain. I would say that's definitely a really uh, unique and creative technique, and I like it a lot. Would you say that your own work has kind of led you to develop this teaching style? Yes. So the first time that I was in a workshop where I was forced to put down my script and get up and start talking, and it was scary and nerve-wracking, but I taped it, and I found out that there was stuff that would come out that I never would have gotten on paper. So I certainly am a craftsman with my work and structure, but as a development tool, I find that improvisational oral storytelling when you're being listened to is wonderful to tap into, again, that creative gold. I think in your, at least from the limited knowledge I have of your classes, and I've certainly seen some of their final work and readings and performances, you have quite a mix of how they express themselves. Poetry, spoken word, performances, isn't that right? Yes, so I welcome all forms of creative expression, and also it all comes from the same place. But they didn't. They don't know they're going there necessarily, right? They they may have never put words to paper before. I have people that have always wanted to write and have been afraid to write. I have people that have been blocked, and so they want to get back to their writing. And I also have professional writers that want to get back to writing themselves. What about pain? I mean, if they want to do memoir, say, or self-expression, do they often hit blocks that have to do with they either want to go someplace that's painful or they want to avoid it? Yes, because, and that's completely normal and natural. We want to avoid pain. And usually it's that they need to voice what has happened and that allows them to discover the actual story. So we walk around with the myth that we've always told ourselves about our stories. But in the writing, it allows the investigation and the discovery and the looking down. And in that, we're going to have epiphanies and discoveries as well as catharsis. And it's also very healing to finally write down the story. It helps take away shame. And then what happens in the group is when pe- when somebody takes a chance and is writing something very personal, very intimate, it gives everybody else permission as well as courage to go to those places. And then it is a powerful experience for the whole group. Would you say self-expression is always kind of a therapeutic experience? Or do you think sometimes it can kind of unlock something within a person they didn't really know it was there and start a whole new kind of trauma? for them? 
Well, you know, I'm, I'm not a therapist, and, you know, my job as a writing facilitator is to create a safe, nurturing place. I can't, nor would I ever force anybody to write anything that they weren't willing and ready to write. So my philosophy and my experience has been, you know, I'll give a writing prompt, and if there's something that's ready to come out, it will come out. And that means if they've started to write about it, that they're at a place where they're ready to look at it, investigate it, and bring it to light. Well, excellent. Terry, we, have, we, have, we applaud your work, and, and I think we're, we're running out of time here, but can you please tell us how potential students can get in touch with you? My phone number is 310-281-3175. My website is creativewrite, C R E A. T I V E R I T E S dot com and my email is Terry T E R R I E at Creative Right. And again, Creative the way you spell creative and R I T E S dot com. Thanks so much, Terry. You've been very generous with your time. Thank you, Terry. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Get published radio will be right back after this message. You know, in all the history of the world, with today's technology, it's never been easier to get published, to self-publish your printed book, ebook, audiobook, even multimedia ebook, and not just novels and memoirs or how-to books and histories. Although, if that's what you've got, let's have it. But also poetry, spoken word, graphic novel, cartoons, children's picture book, interactive video games, virtual reality, and imaginative mashups of all this stuff. Get into the game. Along the way, you'll no doubt need some professional help from an editor, a book designer, a publicist. But isn't the investment in yourself worth it? How about you take the money you'd spend on your next vacation and get famous instead? GetPublishedRadio.com. That's our support website where we've got links to all the resources you'll need. And don't forget that request for services form if you crave some personal attention. That's GetPublishedRadio.com. Hey, it's all about the First Amendment. You can use it or lose it. You know, Runky Productions, the audio magicians can take your radio shows, podcasts, audiobooks, and ads from the streets of New York to the outer reaches of the galaxy. I think we need more echo at the end of that. Oh, look, visit us at R-U-N-K-E-E Productions.com. I still think we need more cowbell. Welcome back to Get Published, where it's, well, all about getting published. Okay, so guys, what about spoken word? You know, and I think this can happen in Terry's class, at least that's what I was getting, is as a way of a new writer getting unstuck or somebody who intends to express but not really knowing quite how. Well, for example, if you are a writer and you have a great idea, a terrific idea for a story and you have characters and a few plot things, if you speak it to another person, you will start to learn that you have flaws in your story and you can mentally mark those down. You will start telling the story, and then suddenly somebody will say, why did he do this instead of that? And you hadn't thought so of that. So you're saying, you know, at home, uh, over dinner, or at the poker game? Or, mm-hmm. or in front of an audience of a thousand people, thousand tell the people. story, yeah, and Cohen. you will be editing yourself. You will see if your story is any good. That's a very good way of... Uh, getting your stuff out. Yeah, I mean, that's like the same advice you gave when we did our show about cookbooks and diet books, talking through a recipe to see if there's any gaps or seeing if, you know, this makes sense to go into this. It, like you said, helps you find those missing pieces or maybe um, something wrong with your story. Because no matter how original or complicated your narrative is, if you're writing poetic fiction, if you are writing science fiction, if you are writing true life fiction, it all comes back to talking. In the beginning was the word, and the word came out of your mouth. Well, and, from and as, your I, brain. as I've said, I've been, you know, at stand up comedy sessions where they consider them workout sessions because the audience is the other comics that are going to try things out. Okay, there's no, there yeah, might be, yeah. uh, you know, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, but. You know, it's really a kind of a semi-pro audience. And sometimes there'll be spoken word people. Sometimes there'll be poets, mostly comics. But one of the things that you'll see is 
somebody get up and they'll often go with what they call observational humor where it and you you, of course you'll see the talk show hosts all the time they're all about observational humor what they read in the paper that morning and so they're going to be doing commentary observation it's often just taking it to where they see it will go and I, yeah. I was really struck with, I was at Igby's Club when it still existed in, in L.A., and one of the writers for The Tonight Show got up, who was himself a stand-up comedy, and he had, it was clear, he had no material. He started in with, who's having a birthday? Where are you from? And this was <laughs> like, I thought, you know, that, how trite. But the thing was, he took it in such strange directions and he found such weird ways of turning it back in on itself I could see he was developing new material and he was going to throw away maybe 19 of the 20 jokes that he discovered but he was mining for gold he was trying to find those and it's kind of what you're saying Tom is that in expressing yourself and getting a reaction whatever the reaction is it may cause some other part of your brain to light up. Exactly. It's an act of creation. And I you think, are creating. Yeah, I think especially with, you know, observational type stuff, you have to find a unique take on it because there's so much observational humor nowadays. We have so many, you know, news shows that are kind of centered on, you know, hu- p- political humor or whatever it may be. So being able to take it in a direction other people might not think of or not even realize could be funny is a big part of that. Well, and I've heard of comic, uh, comedy described as a process of reduction, mm-hmm. where a human is reduced to a child, an animal, or a robot. Oh. Okay, and when you think of silent movies, okay, and, and Chaplin's visual yeah. humor, okay, well, again, you've got the child, animal, or robot, and that, you know, that really kind of covers it. Because being less than human, especially if somebody who's considered pompous, that's an engine of comedy. Exactly. Not the only one. But. Exactly. I remember in that novel, the uh, name of the the name of the word. What was that? It was made into a movie set in the monastery. Before my they time. They hated. They hated com. They hated comedy. All of these strict, very focused. Uh, not prelates. a world we want to live hated in. Hated comedy, and they did not want to translate the Greek uh, commentaries on comedy. Because it reduced humanity. Okay, and that, we're going to have to we're going to have to end up with that. So okay. thank you, Tom. And that's our show. You know, get published is all about self-publishing and self-expression. And that getting published and the ease of getting published these days is really all about exercising the First Amendment in this free society of ours. You know, what we need these days are more ideas. Even though we're deluged with information, we need more good ideas. And we need debate about those ideas. Book-length debate, not just snippets that are posted on social media, not just selfies and cute pictures of your pets, the things that you really think. And remember, because in self-publishing there are no gatekeepers out there, that is the good news and that is the bad news. So hire some good help. Perhaps you found that here. You may find it on the website, whatever you're looking for, whether it's an editor or a book designer or somebody to help you promote. But hire good help, get good advice, and by all means, please get published. The Get Published Radio Show with Gerald Everett Jones is produced by Runky Productions. Music by Jason Shaw at audionautics.com. Our producer is Lori Marple, and your announcer is Bill Navarro. You'll find links to support services on our website, getpublishedradio.com. So whether you're an author, a publisher, or a self-promoter, get help at getpublishedradio.com, and thanks for listening.